Welcome to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Norris. We're going to grow your leadership through neuroscience, psychology, and theology. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. I am so excited today to have on this episode my great friend, Blaine Bartell. And we'll dig into his story, but I want to give a little bio on him. He is a Canadian. He came down to the United States, became a youth pastor, and he had so much uh, favor and uh, and fame. He actually at one time was called the Youth Pastor of America, actually was on a TV show all around the world. I know back when I pastored my first church, uh, we had his Fire by Night TV series that we showed our kids on the regular. And uh, his story, Blaine's story, is one that goes from the height and the pinnacle of what a lot of ministers would love to have all the way to the inner world of pain and sorrow, suffering that drove him towards certain behaviors that ended up creating a lot of consequences in his life. I love his story because it's a redemption story, or as he calls it, a resurrection story. And uh, and so we're going to dig into it. Blaine, man, it is so freaking awesome to have you on the Reading Revival Leadership Podcast. Oh, it's great to be here, Patrick. Uh, so good to connect with you again and uh, to have some time to share with your audience today. So thanks for having me. What a privilege. I love it. Love it. Love it. Well, let's jump into it, man. Let's just go to the real and the raw. Uh, let's kind of begin with the story where you... Uh, like to to start, you've shared your story to large groups, small groups, men's groups. uh, And I just would love to hear you because when it comes out of you, man, it just is riveting. So tell us the story as you want to start it. Yeah, well, the story comes out of uh, a book and now a, a, a mini documentary called Death by a Thousand Lies. And the reason I called it that is At the end of the day, after 23 years of uh, pornography addiction, uh, sexually acting outside of my marriage, and I'll kind of talk through how that happened, but at the end of the day, uh, I just couldn't stop telling lies. And uh, I felt like the best thing for me was to uh, try to beat these battles and win uh, the victories on my own. And as you know, in ministry, uh, there's a certain expectation. that people have for people that stand up and preach, whether it's in a a pastoral uh, position or a itinerant speaking position. And I I just uh, look back today and and my biggest regret is that I tried to lie myself through uh, my life to get help. But it really started when I was 28 years old. And as you as you shared, uh, we had this national television show, and so I'm, I'm getting invited to speak uh, literally every weekend somewhere in the country, doing outside mission trips as well. And I'm, I've been doing this now for about two straight years, gone every weekend, uh, getting weary, uh, uh, not, not really taking care of my soul or my marriage really well, and. Uh, busy, busy schedule. So all that to say, I get into this hotel room one night and uh, there's a white box sitting on top of the TV. It's like 11 o'clock. I I just got back from preaching uh, like the third time that day. And I I know what the box is, Patrick. I I know it's an adult movie box and I'm 28 and I've never looked at porn in my life. Now, there were there were kids in, in school, junior high, whatever, that might bring a picture to school that they they uh, got out of their, one of their dad's magazines. But but in terms of me really accessing or wanting to access pornography, it just uh, it never, ever appealed to me and uh, never, never really sought out, sought it out. But wow. this night, uh, my curiosity just was at a peak. I was exhausted. There was a uh, some level of entitlement, like I deserve a break. I've been just wearing myself out. And so I just, against my better judgment, I hit that red button on that, on that movie box and on came all this adult movie fair and, uh, you know, nudity and sexuality and, 
you know, just stuff I've never seen in my life. And of course, it was a fantasy world that wasn't real, but it sure felt real in the moment. And uh, not trying to be too descriptive, but I masturbated and uh, felt this rush and, and then it ended 10 minutes later, right? And so now the rush has turned to, you know, shame and guilt. And I don't know exactly why I knew it was wrong other than maybe I'd been told it was or I, you know, but I, I felt internally like there was a darkness in this moment. And so I, I remember just shutting it off, like getting my head together and thinking, uh, I, I need to, I need to get this, I need to get this taken care of. So I, I ran down to the front desk. I paid for the movie because I didn't want my, uh, my church that I was visiting to see the bill and, you know, know that I'd watch this. And I, and I remember getting back after paying that bill and, and literally, you know, getting on my knees and saying, Lord, I'll never do this again. Um, it was awful. I know it was wrong. Uh, and I, I just am never going to do this again. I made all these commitments to God and my devotion and my family and, and so, bro, that's where it started. And I didn't do it again for six months. But six months later, all the shame had worn off and the guilt had worn off. And I'm back in the same place. You know, my commitments that I made began to dissipate. I'm exhausted again, traveling again, busy again. And I'm like, all right, do it again. And it just began a slide in my life uh, of just this cycle of, repentance, remorse, you know, falling back in, repentance, remorse, falling back in. And it just went from months to weeks to literally uh, in the end became a daily stronghold or addiction or whatever you want to call it uh, in my life. And, you know, Proverbs says that uh, the the eyes of man are never satisfied and death and uh, this or hell and destruction are never full. And and uh, there's this law of diminishing returns that we're all aware of when it comes to lust, greed, sin, that whatever satisfied you last year, if you've continued down that path, is not going to satisfy you this year. And so my path got darker and darker, and it went from pornography to, like, really wicked pornography. Uh, it really actually started with... Uh, even in the beginning with, you know, really soft core, you know, uh, Victoria's Secret, you know, uh, yeah. you know, swimsuit issues, things like that. But it went to chat lines, live chat lines with women, uh, uh, eventually reaching out in massage parlors. Of course, that has been in the news the last, mm -hmm. the last few weeks. Um, and then, uh, over, over many, many years, uh, escorts or paid, uh, you know, pay for sex with, uh, with women, prostitution. And uh, the last year or two, it, this went on 23 years, uh, the last year or two, that, that whole process of, of uh, you know, getting worse, uh, my, my head went to a place where I thought, well, I'm not, I'm not going to pay for this anymore. You know, I'm better than that. So I disguised myself on uh, dating sites and uh, and began to just meet random women who thought I was single and available when I was actually, of course, married and in church ministry. So it was an awful life. I, I literally lived a Jekyll and Hyde life uh, for, for two decades. And uh, I had two personas. I had... To, Blaine Bartell, the pastor, the minister, the preacher, the whatever, the author. And then I had this other person in this other world who was actually Curtis McKenzie. Uh, I had separate identification. I had this whole other persona. I had this other uh, uh, bio, if you will. I had online information about Curtis McKenzie. I mean, I was just living in two different worlds. I had two phones, two email accounts, uh, and... Uh, Wow. By God's terrifying grace, uh, in uh, Easter week uh, of 2010, uh, he uh, he exposed it all. And uh, wow, 
it was grace because it was it was uh, the beginning of resurrection in my life after death. Uh, but it was uh, terrifying because, like you said in the introduction, every consequence that I imagined could happen as a result of uh, my sin and worse came to pass. Hey everybody, I wanna slide right in here and thank you for joining us for today's episode. Let me ask you for a huge favor. If this podcast is providing value to you, would you consider subscribing to it wherever you get your podcasts? Also, if you feel that it would be valuable to somebody else, please like it, comment on it, and share it on your social media feeds like YouTube, Facebook, or wherever you populate networking. And one more big, big favor. If you like the show, please go review it. And if it's true for you, give us five stars. And when you review it and rate it, it gives our efforts greater opportunity to grow, and that would mean the world to us. Now let's go back to this week's episode. Wow. And in those years, you said that you were in that double life for 23 years, I believe, is what you said. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, you, for the last, I think, five or six years, were pastoring a church plant that was at the same time growing uh, pretty exponentially. I mean, uh, by the time that you were at the end, you had uh, around, I think, a thousand or more people. Uh, plus, you had the momentum of the youth ministry years. And so, you know, it's got to be an unusual thought for you to have all of this ministry stuff that's growing. And oh, then you yeah. know you have this secret life and how you're you know, able to keep both of those uh, plates spinning is uh, that, that had to be interesting for you. So let's go into the emotional side of that during those years uh, where you were living the, the double life. What was that like for you to be disintegrated where you are living in these two different personalities? Oh, it was, it was awful. I mean, you, you, over time, you develop this ability uh, for the most part to compartmentalize. So I could put, put on my Blaine Bartell hat and thoughts and world and kind of live in that world. And then I literally escape and, you know, get in this new compartment, this Curtis McKenzie, uh, addict, sex addict, uh, lying, you know, deceiving, partying uh, world. But there, there are moments uh, that it, it catches up and it's like the two, the two personalities look at each other in the mirror and you realize how awful you are and what an mm -hmm. awful life you're living. And the reality sinks in that you're, you're not just destroying yourself but uh, you have a wife and you have children and you have people that are trusting you uh, and you're breaking their trust. And one day the potential pain that you're gonna bring into their world is gonna be awful. And so you have those come to reality, come to Jesus moments. And even in those moments, you try to repair and you try to fix and you try to figure out on your own how to make that happen. But of course it never works because you don't know how to repair it. And, uh, and it actually, just like if you had cancer, uh, you can't self surgery cancer. Mm, uh, yeah. You have to have a doctor. You have to have someone smarter than you are with cancer. Yeah. And I needed that. I didn't, I didn't have that. I couldn't figure out how to break this, this addictive world uh, that I was in. So you live every day the best you can with both of those worlds confronting you. And you live, honestly, uh, I did. I, I lived in a lot of suicide ideation, a lot of depression. I mean, I fantasized about uh, killing myself, about getting in a, a vehicle, going to like South America, never showing up again, starting a new life. Like I tried to quit the ministry different times with my wife, but of course I wouldn't tell her why. And she talked me out of it. And it was just 
an awful, awful world uh, when you live in that in that uh, that double life. And I'm because I have such a friendship with you, you know, I am very aware and have sat with the empathy of that story and the privilege that we all have to hear your story. Uh, So I I guess I, I as a result of that, I am I'm very aware and connected with you. However, in this conversation that we're having, I'm desiring for our people to experience the. Uh, the confusion, the chaos, the dissension, the inner war that you're having. And so let's jump into that, uh, not only with the two characters, you know, that you're now trying to manage their bios and their projections, but now you're dealing with a wife, you've got three boys, um, you now are probably exploding or shutting down. There's the fight, flight, freeze happening in your marriage. It's got to be happening in your parenting um, simply because whatever's driving the addiction, it's there 24 seven. And when you least expect it, it's, it, it's, it's presenting itself in ways that hurts people. So talk a little bit about the pain that you uh, felt, even what was going on in you as you were you know, interacting with your wife and, and kids. Yeah, you know, I could just remember looking in the mirror on a regular basis at my, you know, at myself and just saying, I hate you. Mm -hmm. Um, Just the self-hatred and loathing. Um, I had just, I, I had. I run out of reasons to live. I mean, I'd run out of reasons to, I even, I mean, I, I didn't like my work. Uh, I'm preaching every Sunday and I, I hated it. You know, I, I just remember praying a short prayer before I preach on Sundays and saying, God, somehow get me through another 40 minutes. I don't know how Mm -hmm. I'm going to make it, but I, I've got nothing. I've got nothing. And it was weird, Patrick. I would just get up there, and it was almost like something took over, and uh, and it would turn out good, like you said. Uh, I'd, people pat me on the back and say, I needed that. What a message. Church was growing. And it was almost like God was, you know, in spite of me loving these people, helping these yeah. people. You know, it was a King Saul scenario, you know, where... You know, Saul was out to kill David and and destroy him. But when David would play, you know, his harp uh, in worship, uh, the anointing would take over on Saul. And all of a sudden he'd start prophesying. And that's the only way to describe it is uh, there was just a somehow a grace. But I yeah, it was just a lot of hatred and a lot of guilt. I mean, seeing my wife every day, seeing my kids Mm -hmm. Uh, was just an awful thing. And really, in the end, uh, I got so careless with, you know, in the beginning, I was just, you know, watch every step, guard every everything. Don't, you know, you don't want to get caught because you're trying to beat this and trying to win this. But in the end, it was just like I kind of let go. And I knew I knew it was just a matter of time before it was over. And I really wish that, I would have had the courage just to say, you know what, just end this, like, go, go tell somebody you trust, get the help you need and, uh, fig- figure this out. Yeah. But yeah. I didn't. And, uh, thankfully today, uh, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of men that are doing that, that are, yeah. are having the courage just to, just to say, you know what, I need help and I, I've got a problem and, and, uh, getting the help they need, but no, it's an awful life, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think about, you know, the tension you would have felt at home. I think of the tension with, uh, those who've entrusted you with ministry over the years, you've had relationship with your own pastors. You've been in what's called church systems. So just like every family has a family system, every character in the system has a role. You uh, were in church systems 
And those church systems, like family systems, sometimes have very healthy things in them. Sometimes they have things that aren't healthy and can promote uh, the hiding of behavior uh, because of what the currency of value in that you know scenario is. Um, and I think about the tension you would have felt of letting people down around you and, and what it would have meant. And that leads me to the question. And of course, it's, it's not a question that I know that we can just put clarifying answers on, but I'd love to explore it with you. Why do you think you didn't find a trusted comrade and begin the work of recovery before it ended up creating such destruction in so many other relationships? Uh, why do you think you didn't? Yeah, I mean, the answer is pretty easy. I felt like I had way too much to lose. And I saw, uh, I saw a couple really powerful uh, examples of what could happen to me. I remember early on when I was, it was uh, a porn problem only, and it hadn't escalated. I had a colleague in my, quote, system, like you said, uh, in our kind of collection of churches that we traveled in, um, who uh, was a youth pastor like me, a youth speaker, uh, confessed to having a porn problem with his pastor. Uh, the guy called me the next day and said, Blaine, I just want you to know you were going to come speak. I'm not here anymore. I confessed to porn and I was fired. And they asked me to leave the church and uh, seek help. So mm -hmm. This guy had been faithful there for 10 years. He was one of the best youth pastors I'd ever met. Uh, he had a family, had kids. And, you know, it's been now 25, 30 years since, maybe 25 years since that happened. No, closer to 30. Well, he's never gone back into the ministry and never did. Uh, I just saw a couple situations like that, Patrick, where it just said to me, you can't trust anybody with your story. Uh, you yeah. will lose your job, you lose your career, your family will be in shambles, and you'll be done. And so my, my pride and my ego and my, uh, my wherewithal that I can beat this, you know, I'm a winner, just kept saying, no, you just, you figure this out. You know, so I'm, yeah. I'm reading books, I'm listening to sermons, I'm, you know, I'm doing everything I can to figure it out. And, and I would have right. momentary victory, you know, seasonal yeah. victory. But it was what I would call like white knuckling, like just holding on for dear life, really not living in freedom, just living in pure white knuckling sobriety for a period of time until finally it shows up, uh, shows up again. So, I, yeah, it was just a complete fear of losing all that I'd worked for uh, and, and just giving that all up. And I just felt like, man, I, I've got to find a better way to do this and to destroy my family in the process. Let me jump in again and tell you about two amazing opportunities for pastors, spouses, and senior leaders of ministry that will increase your leadership. And they're both free. I'm talking about monthly Zooms and also weekly process groups. First, we hold a monthly Zoom event that is one plus hours with Dr. Todd Bowman, a psychologist and human behavior expert, and me. We usually have around 15 to 30 other participating pastors, spouses, and leaders. The monthlies have been amazing to help pastors collaborate around tactics, personnel challenges, and even how to navigate our own inner world. The skills you'll learn and a newfound pastoral community will expand your leadership mapping with everybody you lead. These monthly Zooms happen every month on the second Mondays at 6 p.m. Central Time. And then the second opportunity for pastors and spouses is our weekly process group that spans for six weeks. In our weekly process group, we provide tools that guide you into your story and help you rediscover you, redefine leadership, redeem life, and redream ministry. Weekly process groups give time to open your stories as you collect the dots, connect the dots, and correct the dots. 
Attunement begins with you making sense of your story. When you live with mindful attunement to your story, you'll find that the people you lead will begin to also make leadership sense to you in profound new ways. Our alumni tell us that this is one of the most impactful experiences they have ever had. We place ladies in groups of six to 10, and also we put men in groups of six to 10. The value of the weekly experience is 900 plus dollars per person. However, in this season, we're offering it to you for free. You can see some of our alumni sharing stories on our events web pages. You can find out everything you need to know to get involved in either the monthlies or the weekly process groups by going to redinkrevival.com. I hope to see you there soon. Well, it's so unique uh, because when you look at what ministry is like, as a minister, uh, there's a very unique skill set and effectiveness that happens in other people's lives, and there's value put on what that gifting is. So as a minister, uh, as your gifts begin to grow, there's not a lot of people that do what you do, not when you think of the millions of people that are on the planet. Um, and so you end up having a value and a currency, uh, an income even, for that gifting that creates a standard of living. So your salary ends up being a certain thing and it's a very specialized area of, of work that has uh, allocated certain income with it. So you have a standard of living now that is sustained by this specialization. Well, if you were the CEO of a secular company and you had a porn problem, there would never be an issue that transfers over to your effectiveness as a CEO, not in the way people think about it, and so as in your case, when you're thinking about this, there is this deep-seated survival that if, if I out myself, I'm going to end up losing my salary. And it's not like I have a TV program in Christian TV, but Hollywood's not going to be wanting me to produce a show. So I can't transfer this to Hollywood. And then uh, where do I take my specialized gift set outside of this Christian environment? and make the kind of money that I've created a standard of living that my wife, my kids are used to about my future, my retirement. The threat level that you had to have felt there for coming clean had to be absolutely extraordinary. And the sense of not just the area of like your friend who uh, was fired, he didn't just have survival that he then had to fall back on, he had belonging, and those are our two deepest needs as humans, is how are we gonna survive and where will we belong? So I, I so resonate with ministers when they're in this space where they are trying to get help, but if I make a wrong step here, I could lose everything, everything. And so we end up with ministers who are really unhealthy in so many ways. And then when it comes out like your story or like, Many of the recents in, you know, Ravi Zacharias, or we go back to several others that uh, have been in the headlines, you know, the Carl Lenses and so on. And then Christians, of all people, they beat them like they're an old dirty dog and that they are hypocrites and they're two-faced. And it's like, wait, 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 wait. That's not really the world that, like, Blaine, you lived in. It, you weren't like this bad person. You were broken and didn't know what was going on on the inside and had nowhere to get the help. I'm curious, when you have these guys that you're helping today, what do you think the difference is for them as to why they are coming in courage to open their story to you versus the fact that you didn't feel like you had a safe place to go? What's the difference? Well, I, you know, I'd say about half the guys I coach uh, have been outed either by their wife or some kind of exposure that has happened. Uh, but the half that, that, that worn outed that just came clean, uh, I, I would say almost all of them came clean early enough where it didn't cost them everything. You see, I, I, I have this uh, belief and conviction that if a, a minister has struggled with pornography, 
that they may need some time uh, to heal. They may need, they need some, need some, need some, a season of uh, restoration, uh, but I don't feel like they need to lose their job. I mean, the truth is, uh, folks on the family reported that 64% of pastors regularly watch porn. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but right. let's say it's 50%. I mean, we, you know, do we, do we need to get rid of half of our pastors because they've, they've looked at porn? I don't think so. Right. Uh, is it a sin? Absolutely. Is it detrimental? Can it take us places? Yes. But all the more reason to, to be able to offer a safe and sacred space for church leadership and for pastors to get help. And that, I think that's why guys come to me is they know I've been there. They know I've gone through it and they know I know how to get out of it. Uh, yeah. You know, by God's grace, I've been living uh, nine plus years in complete freedom without any slip up or relapse in pornography or acting out uh, outside of my marriage. And when I was single uh, acting, you know, in, in that former world. So there's there's just a and then, Patrick, I, I I think, and I don't, you know, I don't know if you see this or not, but but uh, this there's a younger generation of pastors that I would put as maybe 45 years of age and below that are a lot more honest and a lot more vulnerable than than my well, world was. You know, well, I'm that's speaking. true. And uh, for whatever reason, they, you know, I think one of their highest values. Uh, is authenticity and being genuine and being vulnerable. And maybe it's because that's who they're reaching. I mean, we, we have a, an up and coming generation that is kind of tired of uh, the show, if you will, yeah, and the right. imagery. And uh, they, they want somebody that will admit they've, you know, they've had uh, problems and issues. So, I mean, my pastor today is, uh, my former pastor's son. So Willie George at Church in the Move was my pastor for years. His son, Witt, is now the pastor. And uh, Witt has, from the pulpit, talked in uh, numerous occasions about his past pornography addiction and yeah. talked about how Jesus, you know, kind of walked him through uh, to, to victory in that area and to uh, surrender uh, in that area. Well, you know, people didn't leave the church and no one asked for him to be fired. Uh, people rallied yeah. around him and said, man, thank you for giving me permission to do the same thing, to, to be honest and, and, and to get help. So, How would you like to reboot your personal finances this year? How would you like to take control of your money, turning small wins into big results? I want to encourage you to check out my wife, Tina's financial coaching business at tinanorris.org. You might be wondering, what is a financial coach? A coach is someone who will personally team up with you to outline financial goals, inspire you with energy, help you stay focused on your goals, and so much more. You can do it all through Zoom, and she provides a free initial consultation, so there's no pain or cost to you for your first steps. Maybe you've been to several Financial Peace University cycles, left with great intentions, but struggled to execute. You need a trainer, a coach, another human that won't shame or judge you to help you stay on track. Tina is a certified expert that will help you with clarifying financial dreams, understanding spending patterns, reviewing all financial obligations, assessing financial and insurance needs, defining a spending plan, understanding your emotional profile related to money, building margin for savings and emergency funds, learning strategies for attacking debt, and referring recommended financial advisors to multiply your tomorrow. And she isn't selling any products, policies, or investments. She is the ultimate financial teammate. As Tina's husband of 30 years, I can tell you firsthand how much of a difference Tina's skills and giftings have made. Our financial portfolio wouldn't be a fraction of what it is today if it wasn't for her. She works with clients that are single parents, everyday people, pastors and church staff, as well as high income professionals. I've known executives of Fortune 500 companies that manage billion dollar budgets at work, but then come home to complete financial disorder and disappointments. 
Shame roars at them as they face the stresses of marriage, kids, and struggling retirement plans. A personal trainer can change the way you think, emote, and behave. If you have friends, church members, clients, or even young marrieds that are launching their financial lives, you will do them all a favor to have them check out this amazing option. If professional athletes need a coach to win the day to fulfill their dreams, then you and I do too. And you won't find anybody better to help you get there than Tina Norris. Set up your free consultation from anywhere in the world today. Go to tinanorris.org to find out all the details. Well, on the idea of uh, a minister, a pastor who is struggling with porn, um, that you know they could keep their job and keep moving forward. I think neurobiologically we see reasoning for that. That we know what happens in the brain escalates in a multiplied way once you move to interpersonal uh, sexualizing. So if you are on calls uh, where you're talking with somebody, that does a different neurochemical, uh, has a different impact. Then if you have skin to skin touching, it's a whole nother level. So in recovery, we know that if somebody is in porn, that we can heal their brain much quicker and the depth of the brain's damage uh, can be recovered in, in a smaller time frame with less resources. Uh, although there has to be a high level of commitment. Um, but when it gets to somebody who's regularly acting out and again, skin touching skin, the neurochemical concoction is so profound that we know that's actually a two to five year recovery process for the brain. Um, sometimes within Christianity, we throw these numbers out and just hope it sticks on the wall. And then we ask over the years, why is it two years? Why does a minister need to stay out of ministry for two years after they've done something that, you know, had an affair or whatever? And different denominations have that as a standard and nobody knows why. Right. And so, you know, some of that just feels a little uh, like some boss somewhere wanted to have power and said, I don't know what to say. Let's just do this. Uh, I think in recovery, you and I both know that there are legitimate reasons that somebody could stay in ministry, but they would need to have accountability around them. And accountability is not uh, where somebody is, you know, bossing them around. Accountability is, is where I'm in their life with therapeutic resources to help them win the day. Um, and so I, I love how you said that. Well, let's move further into your story, man. So, you know, the day came when you got outed and when you did, it was so extremely painful. Um, would you tell that part of the story and go from that part of the story into how you had to confess to your kids and how, uh, and your wife and your mom and dad and how that kind of played out? For sure. Well, uh, I, I was, uh, preaching on a Sunday morning. I it was Palm Sunday, 2010. I was leaving that week for a uh, speaking engagement in Texas. And so I said goodbye to my family after church, presumably was going to the airport to fly out for this meeting. But as as I did often in my secret world, I, I, I would have an engagement, but I would extend it. So I really didn't need to leave till the next day for this meeting. But I left telling them I was going, but went and got a hotel in Dallas uh, for a night and planned one of my nights, you know, one of my excursions. Uh, and so that night in my search for you know, who I was going to meet, ended up uh, meeting a woman that I'd met before. She wasn't an escort or in the sex trade. She was just a single woman that we'd met online, and I'd met her once or twice before. So she agreed to meet, and but she wanted to meet up at a, uh, uh, a bar right next to her house. And I, I wasn't a drinker, I, you know, uh, in terms of you know, that wasn't a big part of my, my world, but I was 
happy to meet her first if she wanted to meet there and have a drink. So I met there and, you know, we had a drink. And uh, the waitress asked for my ID. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in my, what, I'm in my uh, 40s at the time, late 40s, and I'm thinking, well, okay, here's my ID. She takes my ID. Anyways, we have a drink. We go back to her place, and we get back there, and she kind of escapes to the back room, uh, leaving me alone in the living room for a, a moment, and she comes back, and, and uh, she says, well, I know who you are. And apparently what she had done is she had made arrangements with the uh, waitress at the bar to have her get my ID to find out who I really was. So she knew that I was lying. And uh, I don't know how she knew, but uh, she knew. And so she had gone back to the house, Googled me, found all these, you know, places of, you know, my books and church and all all the all the different uh, search uh, sites that came up and and she just looked at me and said listen either you go and confess everything to your family your church or I'm gonna I'm gonna call the media like I'm gonna out you and I tried to talk her out of it she was having nothing to do with it mm-hmm. she was so mad she was angry uh, and not a self-righteous anger uh, You know, she thought I was a legitimate single guy. Like I had lied to her. And, and so it was, it was, it was a tough moment. Uh, I remember just going home that, or not going home, but going back to the hotel that night, just weeping and thinking my life is over. And so I met with uh, one of the trustees of our church and uh, confessed everything to him that not the next day, but the day after. And I uh, walked through my whole story with him. I didn't hold anything back. I just wanted to get it all out. He uh, took me back to uh, Frisco, Texas, where we lived, and uh, showed up at my front door. My wife answered the door. There I am standing with my friend Ron. It was April 1st. She looked at us like it was April Fool's Day because I wasn't supposed to be home. And why is Ron here with you? She was kind of laughing like, what's going on? And uh, she could tell pretty quickly by our somber uh, look that it was an awful day. So I went in and took her into the bedroom and just, I don't even remember how, but just told her who I really was and what I'd been doing and uh, the kind of life I've been living, and she just broke. She just began to weep uncontrollably. She just pushed me back. She started throwing things. She was angry. She ran out of the room, and fortunately, by then, Ron had a couple of our really good uh, friends that had come over to the house to be there for her and to comfort Kathy, and then it was the process of, you know, telling my my three uh boys who were all in their 20s and their responses were as difficult as my wife's. I remember my oldest son just standing up in the middle of the living room in front of all these, you know, my family and my parents who were there and just looking at me with anger and just saying F, 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 Mm -hmm. you and running out of the house. And it was just, you know, as bad as I thought it would be uh, to to disclose, uh, it was worse. I, I, I had no idea what kind of pain, uh, betrayal and lying and hypocrisy, uh, could bring into a family. And it was really the beginning of the end of my life. Uh, at that point, I mean, I, I died a death, uh, in the next year, my marriage, uh, was was gone we worked for a year to try to restore it but she was just so hurt and so broken and and my kids wanted nothing to do with me of course i resigned the church i didn't want to be in the ministry and and i lot you know we house went into foreclosure we lost everything financially it was uh it was an awful awful year uh that year now one of the things in your story even there, I felt such emotion come up in my eyes. Um, but one of the storylines is that you 
actually spent the next several days hearing your wife sobbing over and over and over, and there's nothing you could do. Yeah. The pain of that just is, it's just unbelievable for me. I, I can't imagine even how you process that. Well, it was awful. Uh, it just wouldn't quit. The, the tears would not stop. And yes, you just mm-hmm. hear her in the bedroom, not crying, but like you said, sobbing and crying out to God. And why would you let this happen to me? And, mm-hmm. you know, she'd never been unfaithful. We'd been married 30 years. I mean, she was a true blue wife and lover of, of Jesus. And she just could not make sense of all of this crashing in. I mean, losing her, you know, you know, her trust, her husband, yeah. her children are angry. The church is gone. They were told not to have any contact with us. Friends are gone. Um, it was just, it was the most awful time. And I finally, uh, I remember my parents came up and I told them too, and that was as awful as telling my family because they were so disappointed. And I remember just walking out the backyard uh, and walking right out the back gate and walking two miles to my church, signing or writing a, a suicide note, leaving it with my associate pastor who had no idea what was going on at that point with a name on it. And then walking out onto Legacy Drive in front of our church, which is one of the busiest traffic areas in uh, Frisco, and just walking into traffic, trying to get hit. I mean, just, you know, asking God to take take my life. I didn't own it or I didn't have a gun. Uh, the only guns I had were rifles uh, that were, you know, used for hunting. And I I couldn't imagine using a rifle to shoot myself. So that was that, that was my answer was, I'm just going to walk into this traffic till I get hit. I'm just walking into cars and cars are screeching and trucks are screeching. And I don't know how it happened, but within literally 90 seconds, five police cruisers surrounded me and put me into cuffs and figured out what was going on and took me back home. And the next day I was on an airplane to Phoenix uh, and going to 30 days of uh, locked in rehab. Hey, I want to invite you, if you are listening and thinking, I have so many questions I would like to ask. We would love to address your questions on an upcoming episode. In fact, we may do an entire episode on the one question that you have. If you will simply email us at redinkrevival at gmail.com, we will catalog all of these questions and we would love to be able to address the things on your heart and on your mind. So be sure to get in touch with us and we'll take the journey together. Well, let's dig into that today, just so that the audience knows how the story uh, kind of ends. Uh, Today, you've been in sobriety. You haven't had a relapse in years. Um, So what, what, and you're married to a a new wife and you've done your best to restore friendship with with your ex-wife. You've been able to restore friendship with your kids. And, uh, and they are, they're very honoring and God's given you a resurrection. It's, it's, that is amazing. But it really, all that goes back to this first trip. You go to Phoenix, Arizona, and in Phoenix, you meet one of the premier leaders of sexual addiction recovery, and he looks at you and talks. So let's go into that space. And you've just, you know, you open up your story and then what is, what's he saying to you? Well, he looked at me, his name is Dr. Ralph Earl, and he said, uh, he said, Blaine, I've never heard a story like yours. I've never seen anyone that has covered it up as long as you have uh, and, and done the kind of crazy stuff that you've done over 23 years. And he said, you're, you're the poster child for sex addiction right now in, this, in my world. And he said, and, and not only that, he said, you're also an a-hole. <laughs> Except he actually said it. And uh, coming out, out of the preaching world, that's exactly what I needed to hear. You know, I needed to hear how bad it was, and I needed to hear 
you know, the kind of man that I'd been because I, I, I had been awful. And when you're a preacher, you know, there's a certain level of pride you take and while well, I'm helping people and I'm a good man and I know I'm living in this crazy world, but look how many people are getting help and, you know, others that I'm, and so I, I, I needed to hear the raw truth. And it was a, a beautiful thing for that 30 days to get out of my preacher world and get into a world uh, of psychology that would actually tell me the truth. And yeah. I remember, in fact, I've got my uh, analysis around here somewhere, but uh, I keep it handy because I love to I love to read their analysis of the fact that I was a grandiose narcissist, that I yeah. uh, lived in a, a fantasy world, that I thought more of myself than I should. Um, it just it just so helped me to come back to reality of this is the kind of life you've been living. It's the kind of man you've been, and it's time for you to get your life together and figure out how to do this thing. And 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 it was like it was like all the lights began to come on, Patrick. Because for the first time, I'm not trying to fix myself. I've now got a a surgeon uh, psychologically who can dig into my heart and mind and soul and tell me what's wrong. And so that's what it was. I felt like for 30 days, you know, everything was uncovered and opened and they were doing, uh, you know, a, a full autopsy on what has caused this man to literally die and destroy himself and his family. And so it was a uh, 30 days of complete revelation for me. Amazing. And actually, I, if my memory has it right, that first conversation, he said, uh, because you are the worst case that I've ever dealt with. I think he said something like that. And then he said, uh, I don't think you're ever going to get well. And he well, said, that's because I don't think you'll do the work. Yeah. He said, I doubt you'll ever get free. And he said, because you have no idea the amount of work it's going to take. Amazing. And I looked at him and I said, bro, I just paid you uh, $30,000. <laughs> it's your job to make me better and to fix me. And he said, no, we're just going to, we're just going to tell you what's wrong. We're going to give you the tools. It's up to you to do the work. That's amazing. So you get through the 30 days and you have these just mind blowing experiences with the autopsy. You learn what has happened in your childhood. Uh, there's trauma profiles, there's grief loss that you now then are seeing these linkages, these commonalities that uh, built into the the rage energy that drives towards you know what we call eroticized rage, but it's the energy behind the temptation that's unmanageable. You learn that you're alive in it. You're so excited about it. I mean, that for you, this has to be like unbelievable. But then you transition out of the thirty days, and uh, you think I'm going to be well. I'm from now on. I'm changed. I've been transformed. And it was so shocking to your system to realize, oh, wow, temptation still lurks. So talk us through that part a little bit. Well, it started on the plane home. I get on the plane and, of course, I haven't I haven't had any lust issues for 30 days because I've been in counseling or coaching or small groups or equine therapy uh, every day, 13 hours a day. So for the first time, I'm back in the real world and I get on the airplane and there's this beautiful woman in the aisle and I lust is just brewing up in my soul again. And I'm like, whoa, what? I thought I was past this. And so, yeah, back to real world, back to Dallas, where every woman has a boob job and they're dressed, yeah. you know, seductively. And I mean, it's like and I'm not blaming them. They're, you know, right. They're not my problem. I'm my problem, but I'm still engaged in a lot of desire to return to my former world. And, and to be quite honest, for about a year and a few months, had several uh, slip ups and relapses, uh, especially yeah. in the world of porn. So it didn't get better overnight and 30 days didn't cure me. Uh, all it did was help me to discover, you know, where my issues were, like you said, dealing with uh, trauma, uh, dealing with uh, my childhood, uh, forgiving myself, forgiving others, um, knowing why I was using porn to medicate my soul, uh, what needed to be fixed on the inside of me. And uh, 
learning, you know, what, what good relationships were like. I mean, all of that. And I, I had a lot of work to do. I had a lot of uh, repentance to do. I had a lot of people to reach out to, to ask forgiveness. Uh, I had a lot of repair to do in relationships. And there was a, an, a lot of uh, group work and counseling that still laid before me. And I was fortunate enough to find one of the best uh, sexual addiction counselors that I've ever uh, come in contact with, Dr. Ken McGill, and, and he became my mentor and my counselor for the next two years uh, wow. here in Dallas. And man, God just began. But I'll, I'll tell you, you know, the, the turning point for me uh, in, in my, my freedom journey, Patrick, was I'd been going to these groups and I went to four groups a week. Uh, and there were groups of 12 guys, 10 to 12 guys. You know, you, it was like an AA group, except for sex addicts. Yep. Check in. Here's my story. Here's how my week went. A little bit of discussion, interaction, homework, all of that. So good, good stuff. But I, I noticed after being in, in one of these groups for about a year that a lot of these guys would check in week after week. And it was like they weren't getting any better. And they had been in the group longer than I had. And I kept thinking, do, does this just, do we just hold on to this forever? Do we just kind of get a little bit better? And I, I was a little bit concerned that I was never really yeah. going to get truly free. Uh, and I wanted to believe that this could be totally a part of my past. I really did. I, I, I wanted to believe that I, I, I would never really ever have to return to porn again or return to a massage parlor again uh, or a chat line again. Like I, I wanted to be completely free of that. And I began to question God and ask God, is that even possible? And it was actually on a trip from Kansas City to uh, Tulsa. And I really was not expecting God to speak to me on this trip. I wasn't even really praying, but I, I heard the spirit. Uh, and if I know that might sound weird to some people, but I just heard like I felt like the impulse of God speaking in my soul saying, Blaine, I'm not going to give you a recovery. I'm going to give you or I'm calling you into a resurrection. And what that meant for me was it is possible for you to be a new person. It is possible for you to take on a new life. Now, I'm still kind of the same Blaine. I tell the same bad jokes. I have the same uh, bad haircut. I, uh, you know, I still like hockey, but there's something inside of me that uh, was resurrected. It was like a, a new soul, a new uh, uh, sense of freedom, a new uh, a new desire, Patrick, uh, to, to live a life that that was healthy with uh, the people I loved and that was pleasing uh, to God. And so growing up kind of the, the years before in the recovery world of hearing recovery, 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 it was like the Lord was saying, there's really nothing to recover. You know, there, there's nothing in your past really worth fighting for. Uh, outside of relationships, you know, with my kids and things like that. But in terms of, you know, I didn't want my career back. I didn't want, you know, my church back. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't want my fame back. I, none of that was a desire of my life. I wanted resurrection. I wanted to reimagine what, what life could be. And when I kind of got onto that, uh, that mind frame and that thought, process, the Lord just began to do something really deep in me and say, you know, give up all of whatever your past was. Uh, let it go. Even your relationships are never going to be the same. And he began to resurrect uh, just a new future in my heart, a new joy, uh, a new sense of peace and uh, and a new freedom. I mean, I, I can't even explain it today, but uh, this this old world that I used to live in isn't even on my radar today. And that's not any credit to my will. It is a credit to this resurrection work. And it's it's not a it's not a miracle work. Uh, the work of resurrection is cultivation and it's growing the fruit of the spirit and it's doing the work every day with Jesus and with others. Uh, yeah. But it's a work that can and will produce real freedom in our lives. Let me break in one more time and tell you about ReadingRevival.com, R-E-D-I-N-K, Revival.com. I want to encourage you to sign up for our blog e-newsletter there, as every month it will hit your inbox with a provocative blog post 
with topics about theology, biblical architecture for emotions, and how understanding the human brain is so helpful in giving more insights to various biblical texts. We also will feature updates on our monthly events to help you keep up on the ready for everything that is available to you. Also, I'd like to remind you if this podcast is serving you with valuable insights to subscribe to the podcast. If you think someone else would benefit from it, please review it, comment, and share it on your social media platforms. If your friends are privileged to know what's helping you, who knows what God might do in their life with the same resources. That would be a gift to us and it would be a gift to all your friends. We're holding you in our hearts and believing God with you for a year of supernatural increase. Yeah, oh, I think it's, I think it's so amazing. And I love all the language and imagery that you are giving with that. Uh, I think about how many people within Christianity think that an addictive behavior is a spiritual issue. And then it's a spiritual soul issue. But I think the way you described the story helps us see it's a physiological story. It's the way that your body works. So when somebody has, uh, like yourself, 30 days of training, that is not, that is not sufficient to get your phys physiological systems to be able to promote you towards the kind of life you want. It's kind of like nobody would know it at this point in my life, but I go to the gym on the regular and I lift weights. I have a trainer who is a friend of mine as a bodybuilder. He's a bodybuilder. So, I mean, you know, he will do some workout routines and then do his pose in front of the mirror and you just... You just hear the, ah, you know, the angels are singing and it's, I mean, it's amazing. Um, but when I do it, when I work out, I'm watching videos now on YouTube of, you know, technique and because technique is very important to be able to uh, separate different muscle groups, to be able to hit them and to create a swell. Well, all of that kind of stuff, I can watch it. I can learn it. I can sit there and be like, that's incredible. I can get inspired by it. But to be able to have a body that's a bodybuilder builder, you know, a body, that's probably not going to happen for a year or, or two years. And that's if I'm giving everything I got to it. Why? It's physiological. Well, the brain is physiological. And I think about the story of when you got on the airplane. And this would be an area that a lot of people would not know that uh, your brain has mapped all these circuits around expectation. And for 23 years, every time you walked out of your house, there was built the anticipations of sexual encounters, which gave heavy releases of dopamine, which built these super highways. Well, just because you went 30 days to a rehab did not cause those highways to go away. So the sense, the, what you smelled, what you saw, the excitement and adrenaline hitting, uh, I'm going to be traveling again. All of that was a map. There was a map your brain had built. And so what you did for the year, two years, three years after that is completely, I'm going to the gym every day and I'm doing the work with the right people. And when I do, one day my muscles will be at a place that I can more easily lift weights. And when temptation comes against me, um, it becomes manageable. I'm still in life going to be tempted, but it's manageable and I know what to do with it. It doesn't, it doesn't grab me and I don't become the victim to it. And all of that is because of you reprocessing all that emotional stuff on the inside. I love what your story is about. And I've told you, you know, many times just that your story is one for me. You know, I, I, and this isn't any noble statement. Um, it's, if anything, just the grace of God. And it has to do with my own, you know, backstory. It's different than yours and what the energies are that are driving me versus what drove yours. But I never acted outside of my marriage. I've, I've never uh, acted in that way. It, uh, in years gone by, you know, when I was a young kid, I had access to porn and there was experiences with that, uh, even into as a guest speaker. Um, where I'm like, what, you know, and trying to figure that out. Um, but I never acted outside of my marriage. But when I hear your story, one of the reasons the emotions come up in my eyes so strong is because I am 
uh, so aware of what was potentially there, what could have happened in my life. And I don't see you as an outlier. I see you as somebody that's like me. So when I see your story of resurrection, Blaine, when I see your story of resurrection and these years of sobriety and how you're helping men, it gives me hope. And even though, again, I, I've never acted outside my marriage, but it gives me such hope that, you know, God has created true freedom for every human being in every scenario of life. And I sometimes see Christian ministers and men who've just lost hope around that they're stuck and they don't know how to move forward. So today you have a ministry. And in fact, uh, as you said, there's a documentary that you created off of your book. And I don't know if the camera gets it here, but Death by a Thousand Lives. This is your book. Great book. Highly encourage everybody to get it. It's an easy read. Blaine is a, and I don't do this to placate you, but you write where everything is so easily accessible. And, uh, and it's filled with great therapeutic principles. It's not just your story. It's a story that equips people as well. So you have the book, you have a documentary that uh, has gotten a lot of hits and a lot of excitement. And then, uh, and then today you have a ministry where you invite people who are in the struggle to come and go on a journey. Uh, could you talk some about what you're doing to help men and what is available to men? And if it's true of spouses as well, uh, what are some of the resourcing you have? Well, just a couple quick things, uh, Patrick. Yeah, my heart is just to help uh, help men and, and pastors, uh, church leaders. So at BlaineBartel.com, uh, we have uh, coaching uh, available there. So you can read about our coaching uh, opportunities. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching with men weekly. So if they're in Tulsa area, we'll meet in my home office. Uh, nationally and internationally, we do, of course, Zoom and, and other formats. Uh, so that's intense. Uh, the coaching is not just a, a session or two. It's literally uh, 90 days of every week, us meeting together, and then them doing uh, another nine months of group meeting in my private online group. Uh, we're also introducing a brand new small group uh, curriculum master class, eight weeks, uh, professionally done video workbook called Gatheros, and that's going to be uh, released to churches so that they have uh, a tool and a resource that they can use to take men through for uh, purity and uh, how to be free from porn, all of those things. So we have uh, developed that over the last four years, and we're actually launching that in April right after Easter at Church on the Move with about 100 guys so excited about that. And one more thing that I want to really want to get out there is we have a, uh, a brand new website that just went live this week. It's called The Confessional, and it's a, uh, a private uh, online opportunity for pastors and church leaders who are struggling on any level with anything to reach out to me privately in a private email to confess whatever it is they're struggling with. It may be loneliness, it may be uh, depression, hopelessness, uh, a sexual issue, alcohol issues. Uh, we've already had several pastors that have uh, reached out through that private online confessional and uh, it's completely confidential. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the only one it comes to is me and we just set up a conversation uh, after they reach out. And then we've got all these resources that we can make available to them. And uh, they're all free. So I've got a, uh, a licensed counselor that's been doing all this kind of counseling in Tulsa here for 20 plus years. He's offering himself as a resource if the, if the person wants, wants it. I'll uh, coach them. I'll work with them. And then we provide other resources as well. So. So what if a pastor uh, comes to you and says, I have this, let's say they have your story where they are, you know, frequenting massage parlors, they're going to, uh, you know, escorts, they are doing anonymous hookups, et cetera, um, and they're pastoring or they're leading a ministry. If they come to you, are you going to force them into any decision making around their ministry while you're helping them? 
No, absolutely. because that's one of the reasons. That's one of the reasons they won't come. Yeah, no, absolutely not. Uh, my job is to pray for them, to answer their questions, to share my story with them, uh, yeah. and my my hope is that will the lights will come on for them to make their own choices and their own decisions. Yeah. If they ask yeah. me, do you think I should talk to my wife about this? My answer will be yes, but that's your decision. And yeah. uh, I'm not going to make that decision uh, for you. And, and the cool thing is, you know, I've been doing this for four years and I've done that with at least 40 pastors and uh, all save maybe five have all, have all uh, done the confession that was appropriate uh, for them. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not there to twist an arm you know, I, I did this simply because I wish I would have had this. And I think if I would have had something like this to reach out to where I was, knowing it would be anonymous, it would be confidential, that the, there were no repercussions, that it would have got me to the first place to at least get help, to at least confess, to at least have a brother pray for me. And I think possibly that would have given me maybe the, the courage to take the steps that would follow after that. See, I love that. I love what you're doing. I love how you're doing it. And I want to encourage anybody struggling uh, to come and, and to access what Blaine has. Now, for clarity, uh, is all of your resourcing just for pastors, ministers, or is it for any Christian man or any man who's just desiring to get help? No, we, we do at least uh, 60% of our coaching with men just in the marketplace in the business world, uh, students, college kids. So we, yeah, we've, we've, uh, we've coached or I've coached, uh, athletes, entertainers, uh, pastors, <laughs> CEOs. I mean, it's just, it's amazing how far reaching this epidemic is right now. So yeah, whoever is struggling, just reach out. And, uh, and we have, we have fees and all of that, but we also have scholarship, uh, money that is given to us through our partners. And so uh, if you're a man and you check out the website, uh, man, it doesn't matter where you are financially, just reach out, let us know where you're at. We'll, we'll find you some help. That is so awesome. Well, I want to hit one question. Usually a lightning round would be multiple questions, but one question that's real and raw. And I just want your candor. I, I don't even know where this will go. Don't care where it'll go. I just would love to hear what you have to say. Uh, when you hear about the story of a Robbie Zacharias, so today in the presses of Christianity, in fact, I saw one headline on YouTube, don't even know what the video said, but the headline was, is Ravi saved? Will he be in heaven? Then you have uh, people who uh, want to take all of his books, all of the gifts, all that he's ever done and just, you know, cancel anything Ravi. Um, and you see the beauty, the wonder of the grace of God, the image of God that was projected through him for years. Um, w when you think of Ravi today and with the you know research and all that went into the investigation of him and even his family admitting or acknowledging that it was true and loving the victims uh, that were perpetrated on. But when you, when you hear about Ravi, what do you think? Well, I think of myself and uh, I think it was only God's grace that my exposure came before death and not after. Uh, so I, uh, I have wow. great empathy for the victims as you know, yes. just as I have empathy for the people that I victimized by my own, my own actions. But I, uh, on some level, there's an empathy for him as well. Uh, yes, that he was a I have huge man. empathy. Yeah, he was a broken man and uh, lived, you know, I, I, I imagine him living in the same world I was where he had a sincerity with the gospel. I mean, I read his book uh, the month before this announcement came out or this, this uh, exposure came out and his book just was amazing. I mean, the man had a a gift to write and a gift to speak and an intellect. Uh, and there's no doubt that, yeah. that God had used him. And uh, I don't doubt for a moment that he, that he had a relationship with the Lord, but obviously uh, there were still things that had not been healed and worked out in his life. And I just, uh, yes. 
grieve that he didn't have that opportunity to do that on this side of uh, this side of eternity. Yeah, I love I love your heart about that. I'm with you. I have tremendous empathy uh, for him, uh, for the victims. I have tremendous care and desire to see them validated and loved. Yes. But to demonize Ravi, which often happens within Christianity, uh, I don't think helps anybody. I, uh, I think that his books are still valid. I think uh, his gift that he left is still valid. Uh, I will read his books. I will encourage people to read his books. Now, when I do, I'm not going to I'm not going to color anything but honest and with honor. So honesty would be because here's my thing that if. Uh, if we have to take any Christian and invalidate their ministry because of character, there's a bunch of stuff we're cutting out of the Bible because there's a bunch of stories in the Bible that exactly fit that. So if we can't have published records of what they did good, then let's just get rid of everything. And then what all we got in the Bible is is what Jesus said because everybody else is jacked. So I uh, I just I believe in the value of the honor. I also believe in the the empathy and compassion towards the pain. Sin matters, sin creates destruction. Um, so we would never wink at that. But what I find within Christianity, and I'll close my thoughts with this, what I find within Christianity is many of the leaders will say, this is how I'm gonna handle Ravi, because it feels like there's an anxiety that if I can't control this, that somehow or other, I'm going to not survive or belong. And it's like, I let's just, throw that out the window. I don't need to belong and survive based on Christian judgments that go back and forth. Um, and that's one of the things I've always loved about you, Blaine, is that you're a person of compassion, you're a person of empathy, and you, uh, you're going to be honest with people. There's not going to be any dodging, but you're also going to be somebody who empowers people. What a great, great uh, conversation we've had. Thank you again for sharing your story. And even more than that, thank you for your friendship with me. I value you beyond what I believe I'm capable of letting you know. Um, but uh, I so appreciate you being on today. Bro, always good. Love you too, man. And uh, we'll catch up again soon. 